Welcome back from coffee. It's nice to see you all back here. I have a couple of conference notes before we begin our keynote. Um, I just want to invite all conference participants uh, to come out with us tonight. We have decided, if, if you'd like to, uh, we will go to the pub tonight uh, and kind of celebrate the end of our conference together. We'll meet at the Porter's Lodge at about 6.30 and we can walk to the pub if you'd like to go. Uh, we can talk more about this afterwards. Also about tomorrow, those of you who are checking out, you need to check out by 9.30 a.m. Uh, the students are coming back and the staff needs to prepare the quarters for the students who will be in Robinson College. You're welcome to have breakfast from 7.30 to 9 and then check out at 9.30. Uh, I know some of you are staying a little bit longer. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Daria or myself. So in what has been, in my opinion, a very fast two days has brought us to the conclusion of this conference, the whole of the Moran Global Perspective. And we really have been around the globe through our presentations. And I've learned a lot about a, diff a lot of different areas that I haven't considered in the research on the famine and the whole of the Moor. Now, it is with great pleasure that we have a final keynote speaker tonight that's going to talk to us a little bit more about this topic. Our keynote speaker tonight is the history is a professor of history and Germanic and Slavic studies at the University of Victoria. He is the author of many books on modern Ukrainian history and Russo Ukrainian relations, including the award winning Stalin citizens everyday politics in the wake of total war um, from 2014 the conflict in Ukraine what everyone needs to know, which I highly recommend. And Ukraine birth of a modern nation among many other articles and texts. His book, Ukraine, Birth of a Modern Nation, was the first historical survey to include the 2004 Orange Revolution and has since been translated into five languages and perhaps more by this point. Um, he has also written about Soviet nationalities policy and Ukrainian national identity from the late 19th century to the present. He's also the current president of the Canadian Association for Ukrainian Studies. So it is a great honor to welcome Professor Sergei Yakelchuk up to the stage to give our final keynote address for our conference, The Whole of the and Global Perspective. Please join me in welcoming Sergei. Thank you very much, John, for the uh, generous introduction. Thank you all for staying um, until this uh, final keynote. Um, I have to say that I also have learned quite a bit during these two days. I don't actually do research on the starvation itself, but so much of what I do, as I now have realized, is in fact connected to the Great Famine, connected to the way the Stalinist state was reshaping Ukraine and creating Soviet Ukraine. So it would perhaps be a good point, a good starting point for my presentation to begin with the transfer of the capital in 1934. The capital of Soviet Ukraine was moved from Kharkiv in the east, right on the Russian border, to Kiev, which is pretty much a geographical center of Ukraine. There was never a clear explanation from the Soviet authorities about why exactly it was possible or desirable to move the capital. Um, when breaking the news to the members of the Central Committee, Pavel Postashev, the second secretary of the Ukrainian Communist Party Central Committee and Stalin's envoy in Ukraine, made only a few points about this decision. Perhaps the most important point was that it emanated from Comrade Stalin in person. After that, of course, no questions were necessary, but Postushev went on to um, make one point, that moving the capital to Kiev would facilitate the continued national cultural development based on the Bolshevik Ukrainization in connection of the industrialization and collectivization. I realize it sounds very Stalinesque, Stalinesque and uh, 
just like a collection of terms that are not necessarily going to make it clear or even fit with each other. But it really said something uh, to the assembled members of the Central Committee when Postashev broke this news, that it was, in fact, about making Ukraine Soviet, that Ukraine was now sufficiently Soviet to have a capital in the traditional capital of the region in Kiev. And of course, everybody knew, or at least those gathered in the building in Kharkiv, knew perfectly well that the reason for not making Kyiv the capital of the Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic was precisely the fact that it had served before that as the capital of Ukrainian non-Bolshevik polities and governments. And so it was marked in a, in a way. But also in terms of Bolshevik social analysis and also cultural logic, Kyiv had been marked in a different way too. It was traditionally a Tsarist administrative center of the Southwest. It was also the religious center of the entire region, if not of all the Russian Empire. So there were symbolic moments of uh, Kyiv's uh, persona as a city that were decidedly non-Bolshevik. And yet the one which uh, Postashev picked up for his explanation had to do with the Ukrainianization. So in 1934, the Bolsheviks were mu much more comfortable moving the capital further from the Russian border and closer to the part of Ukraine, which they had seen for a long time as problematic. And of course, for us, the participants of this conference, the year 1934 is quite meaningful. It is the year after the genocidal famine, and it's also the year when repression of um, Ukrainian cultural figures reached its second stage. So it's basically the year right after the attack on, on the peasantry and the year of continued uh, suppression of Ukrainian political thought and cultural creativity. It is, in other words, the interim result of genocide. So now in order to figure out exactly what was encoded for the Bolsheviks in this rather sophisticated or perhaps even obscure language of why exactly it would be good for Soviet Ukraine to have a capital now in Kyiv. We should probably go back to two texts from the late 1919 and early 1920, which are not usually used um, as a required reading in courses on Russian, Ukrainian, Soviet history. So I do use them. The first one is a curious article by Lenin's from December 1919, entitled The Elections to the Constituent Assembly and the Dictatorship of the Proletariat. That year, in the fall of 1919, Lenin drafted and published several articles which dealt with the issue of the dictatorship of proletariat, in other words, the form of the Soviet state. Uh, some of them remained undeveloped, they only existed in the form of CVs. But you could see that he was working precisely on the issue of what the future Soviet state is going to look like. December 1919, of course, for those familiar with the history of the Russian Civil War, is precisely the moment when the Bolsheviks uh, just finally defeated Denikin. They were on the verge, on the verge of uh, the collapse of the Red Front in the summer of 1919, or December 1919. They're way more comfortable in their thinking that they are on the path to victory. And so Lenin finally gets a moment to look back at something from the year 1917. In the fall of 1917, elections to the Constituent Assembly, scheduled by the Russian Provisional Government, took place in a great many provinces of the former Russian Empire. Not for all provinces the results were provided, but Lenin had um, a statistical um, source for his research, and he calculated, um, somewhat obsessively, he even corrected his source, saying that he came up with a different total and he was quite comfortable with his own calculations, the total of votes cast. But one important conclusion of this calculation was that 
In Ukraine, in the Ukrainian provinces, the Bolsheviks didn't do all that well during the elections to Constituent Assembly. As you know, the Constituent Assembly uh, really played no role in Russian and Soviet history, so for Lenin it was a hypothetical exercise in free elections, really, something he was not willing to grant, but something he felt could indicate important trends. And so, in the Ukrainian provinces, the Ukrainian parties, together with Russian socialist revolutionaries, really dominated in the elections. Especially, Lenin says, when it comes to the provinces that are predominantly rural. What conclusions should we draw from this observation, asks Lenin? Well, the obvious one is the importance of the national question. That the Bolsheviks cannot really ignore the national question, and they need to um, accommodate the national interests of the Ukrainian peasantry. That to Lenin meant uh, creating some form of a polity, no doubt puppet polity, but still the Ukrainian Soviet one, and making concessions to the rights of the Ukrainian language. Um, in this text, as well as in several others from 1919, you almost get a sense of Lenin trying to persuade his party comrades to do that. They do resist. Um, and he realizes, of course, that the party comrades do not speak Ukrainian. The party comrades come from different backgrounds, and he has no qualms about identifying them in this text as uh, great Russians and Jews. And he says that they should, in fact, abandon uh, the great power uh, cultural politics and observe the rights of the Ukrainian culture. So that's a curious comment. 1919. It does translate into several decisions uh, already in 1920. Eventually, it's going to be the background of 1923 decision to uh, institute a full-scale Ukrainization in the Republic. But it actually indicates to us something interesting, that Lenin feels that the Ukrainian peasants hold a lot of power. They need concessions. They're entitled to concessions. There's also something he doesn't say in this article. But if you study the political situation in the fall of 1919, you would know right away what it is. Denikin has just been defeated. One reason for Denikin's defeat is precisely his refusal to accept any uh, even federal or even autonomous form of organization in future Russia. His refusal really to deal with uh, the Polish representatives and Ukrainian representatives as well, something his successor, Randall, would partially reconsider. So Lenin doesn't want to repeat the same mistake. But he knows, of course, that in reality, these concessions to the Ukrainian peasantry are not going to be for real or for too long. And for us, there are three interesting linguistic clues in this article. Um, first, Lenin starts by speaking of the relationship between towns and the countryside, and he says that under developed capitalism, towns inevitably lead the countryside. So the only political question for the Bolsheviks is precisely what part of the urban population would in fact lead, or should we say control, dominate the countryside. He wants it to be the Bolshevik part. But ultimately, the relationship between the town and the country in much of Eastern Europe is, of course, the colonial relationship, which was established in the course of centuries prior. Lenin realizes full well that the Bolsheviks have support precisely from the urban classes in Ukraine that are Russian-speaking and do not associate themselves with the Ukrainian national project or the culture of the peasantry. So he is well aware that the Bolsheviks are winning in Ukraine as a result of relying on the sectors of the population that identified with the previous cultural project, the imperial one. So that's one uh, linguistic clue. The other is that he says from the Marxist point of view, the working class needs to capture the power and then it needs to neutralize the peasantry, or better yet, win over it eventually, but not right away. 
Lenin Death has a very curious footnote, and he always he's a master of run-ons. He goes on and on and on, just making the same point over and over. And that point happens to be in this article is that we should not idealize democracy. The Bolsheviks should not win democratically. The point is they would win, and after they win, they actually create the state and society, which would be free and democratic in Bolshevik understanding. But that too really sounds like a program for conquest more than anything. And also given this consideration of colonial background of those urban classes in, 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 in the former Russian Ukraine, together they don't sound particularly well to the reader of the 21st century. But of course, I'm sure there are people who would find nothing wrong with that, uh, plenty of them. Uh, in Canada as well. And then Lenin says towards the end of the article something even more interesting. This is about stealing the slogans. Now he says, he acknowledges freely and openly, that the Bolsheviks stole the thunder from the socialist revolutionaries, from the Russian ones. They basically, in the decree on the land, introduced, without changing anything, the social revolutionaries' main slogan about the land without changing anything, which he says um, resulted in complaints from the socialist revolutionaries. But Lenin says, that's ridiculous. Why would you complain? You are talking about it. We have implemented it. What matters to my analysis is the notion of stealing slogans. Because in fact, the slogan of the Ukrainian peasantry, being interested in the Ukrainian language and the Ukrainian school and the national autonomy, is the one which is quite easy to steal. It was advanced by Ukrainian social democratic parties and um, other center-left parties and center parties in 1905 and between 1917 and 1920. So overall, the sum my summary of uh, Lenin's argument is actually quite gloom, right? So we do know that the cities are going to dominate the countryside. It's just the question of who, which, um, stratum in the cities is going to dominate the countryside. That requires the neutralization of the peasantry, which is in itself an interesting term. And, of course, the Bolsheviks wouldn't mind stealing some slogans without, of course, truly ever intended to implement them, just in order to win a short-term um, allegiance of the peasantry. So that's his program. It's December 1919. In January 1920, just really only two weeks later, Stalin publishes an article, The Military Situation in the South. Well, in most cases, you have to be a military buff in order to even know about the existence of this article, because Stalin really deals in a rather crude way, in a sociological way, with the reasons for Bolshevik victories in the Civil War. There is one point which he emphasizes, which uh, merits analysis for our purposes. And that point is that a significant factor for the Bolshevik victory was that the Bolsheviks always controlled inner Russia. That's the translation uh, used in English in this particular version. And therefore, on the side of the Bolsheviks, there was the national unity, whereas the opponents of the Bolsheviks controlled the outskirts of the empire, in which there could be no national unity because these forces were disunited. They had different uh, political programs, Imperial Russian, uh, National Democratic, all kinds of others. So far so good, but Stalin, isn't he really saying here that the Bolsheviks, in fact, really are reconquering the empire on behalf of ethnic Russians? That's precisely what he is saying. In fact, this slogan appears in several of his other texts from the period of the Civil War, including the text from um, the period of the um, Soviet-Polish War in 1920. So he absolutely has no problem recognizing that, that the Bolshevik victory is based, in fact, uh, not just on the support from the proletariat, he uses that term as well, but also on the fact that the Bolsheviks represent the national interest of the great Russians. Well, now after we've looked at these two wonderful statements, let's also remember the Tsarist legacy, and that's precisely what the Bolsheviks were to deal with in Ukraine. The legacy of 
banning the use of the Ukrainian language, refusing the permission to construct monument to Shevchenko, and basically demonstrating at every turn that Russia was an oppressive empire. As we know, Lenin um, has discovered the issue of national oppression quite late in his political career, around 1913, 1914, in connection with his stay, in fact, in Poland, where, according to Soviet historians, and I'm not quite sure whether to believe them, he actually attended a party on Shevchenko's birthday, a Ukrainian party in Poland. One wonders, in fact, whether Lenin was wearing his Vishivanka, the embroidered shirt to that party. But it's very clear that he realized at that moment that concessions are going to be necessary. It is from that moment that he starts drafting texts for politicians, for Bolshevik politicians, to deliver in the Duma, the state Duma of the Russian parliament. One such text was not actually delivered, but we have a draft written in Lenin's hand. It was written for Grigory Petrovsky, the character you have met already during these two days of the conference, and I'm going to talk about him as well a bit later in my presentation. The text was all about Russia being the prison of the nations. Lenin is, in fact, using that very term, which uh, would be used after World War II, by uh, liberation movements of the oppressed nationalities. And the examples Lenin gives, in fact, are connected precisely to the prohibitions of the Ukrainian language and the celebration of Shevchenko's 100th anniversary in 1914. So already then, already then, he understands the importance of Ukrainian demands. But of course, they never constitute a central part of his program. In fact, his program is just opposite. And nationalism, quote unquote, nationalism is something which is supposed to disappear with gradual development of Soviet statehood. Therefore, we do have a picture of concessions that are temporary in nature and could in fact be very, very well be violent because they do reproduce imperial policies which are often violent. They rely on the understanding present among the population of the former administrative centers in the Russian Empire. The Russian speaking, Russian and Russian speaking population of such major cities as Kiev, of course, still has the understanding established in Tsarist times. That is, that Kiev is an informal capital of Little Russia. And Little Russia is part of Russia. And the Little Russians are one of the three tribes of the great Russian nation. So what happens then when you have pragmatic politicians um, thinking of temporary concessions prepared to use political violence and also relying on the social groups that very clearly still function on the principles elaborated under the Tsarist rule? Well, what happens is, in fact, the construction of Soviet Ukraine. So let me see how this unfolds. During the Ukrainian Revolution of 1917-1920, the national governments often complained, but with good reason, of a little support they received from the Ukrainian masses. That is, in fact, true. Um, in the work on the Ukrainian Revolution, scholars typically make a point that uh, the Ukrainian authorities expected to have a huge army but they never really received it. All those Ukrainians volunteering for the Ukrainian regiments when the Russian Imperial Army was collapsing, in fact, subsequently deserted or switched to the Bolshevik side or proclaimed neutrality during the war between the Ukrainian People's Republic and the Bolsheviks. A new army had to be created from scratch. And that really indicated the issue which was realized only retrospectively. That is, the Ukrainian peasantry came to support the Ukrainian national state only after it was defeated. That is, because of a military struggle in Ukraine extending all the way into 1921, 
the Bolsheviks were very late in introducing their policies in that particular region. And I speak in particular about policies in the agriculture. So the Ukrainian peasants had only fragmentary experience with the Bolsheviks until the military conflict was over. And for that reason, it was the legacy of the Ukrainian revolution that became more powerful than the revolution itself had been. Going into the 1920s, massive rebellions of Ukrainian peasants took place all around the country. During these, there were numerous references to the Ukrainian authorities, and in particular, to the name of Petlura, uh, perhaps the most important leader of the Ukrainian People's Republic uh, during its uh, latter part of its existence. Why would Petlura suddenly become so enormously popular with Ukrainian peasants? Well, because they now had the experience with Lenin and Stalin. And now for them, uh, the national cause was joined with the cause of resistance to the Bolshevik collectivization attempts and the general installation of a political regime in the countryside, which was not Ukrainian at all, whatever declarations Lenin asked his comrades to issue. What it meant also that the Bolsheviks behaved in the occupied Ukrainian provinces very much in the same way as the other occupying imperial armies of the day. It's little known, well, it's quite well known actually that, that Lenin requested as soon as the Bolsheviks moved into Ukraine in, in the late 1917 and early 1918, that Lenin requested immediately the deliveries of grain by special trains guarded by reliable comrades. Send trains, more trains, he telegraphed, or St. Petersburg or Petrograd will perish. So he actually very clearly saw Ukraine as a key to winning the civil war in Russia and providing for the Russian workers and elites, which is precisely what the Bolsheviks were doing. But as I said, fragmentary, because they never really controlled significant uh, territorial expenses in Ukraine until 1920, or even until the end of 1920. But there is a largely forgotten story of the food parcels that the soldiers of the Red Army were allowed to send regularly back home to their families. Now, those of us who work on World War I and the revolutionary turmoil in Eastern Europe at the end of World War I know perfectly well that the German soldiers in 1918 were allowed to send parcels home from Ukraine. And these very parcels actually played a significant role in the German political imagination. So soldiers' families did receive the parcels, but the German army was not able to deliver significant supplies of food from Ukraine in 1918. And that resulted in a major kind of feeling of disillusionment, disappointment, and anger at Ukraine, because it was established that Ukraine had everything, but of course the peasants resisted, and that was the problem. Everybody remembered that, so did Hitler. And of course, when Hitler did mention Ukraine in his table talks, as you know, he didn't fight on the Eastern Front. His military experience was, in fact, on the Western Front. But in his table talks, he would mention Ukraine very rarely. But when he did, on one occasion, he said, the Ukrainians are ungrateful. Um, they, they had killed Field Marshal von Einhorn, who wanted to bring civilization to them, but they ungrateful, they killed him. Now, of course, Hitler was confused in a profound way about who killed Field Marshal von Einhorn. It was actually a Russian socialist revolutionary terrorist who had nothing to do with Ukraine, just that it happened in Ukraine. But this whole concept of ungrateful Ukrainians is actually very telling, because perhaps Stalin also had his view of ungrateful Ukrainians. Now, this significant scholarship on the difference between the uh, German projects in Eastern Europe during World War I and World War II, what in World War I was seen as a civilizational quote-unquote mission, uh, all this, you know, postcards with German soldiers cutting the hair of native children because that was a civilizing act, 
And of course, the disillusionment uh, with Eastern Europe, which of course would result in World War II in a very different genocidal approach to it. But perhaps the Soviet regime underwent a similar evolution. If in 1919, Lenin had forced the Bolsheviks to observe at least the, form the formalities of using the Ukrainian language and pretending there is a Ukrainian polity which is making some kind of decisions and such. That's not at all the attitude Stalin would take in the 1930s. Instead of calling Ukrainians ungrateful, he would speak about the two different Ukrainizations. The Petlurite Ukrainization, allegedly run by nationalists, and the true Bolshevik Ukrainization. That was his way to indicate that the Ukrainians, or at least the Ukrainian elites, and the peasants, but that pretty much sums up his vision of the Ukrainian nation, the peasants and the cultural elites, that they were ungrateful, they were given an opportunity in the 1920s to develop the national language and culture, to occupy at least some positions in the state apparatus, to move into the cities, but they were ungrateful, they became nationalists, they conspired, also he believed, against the Bolshevik rule, and moreover, they did so clearly in, un in, in, in union with foreign Ukrainians and some foreign states, first of all, of course, Poland. Now, so if, if we see these two programs as developing from the period of the Ukrainian revolution, then great many things suddenly start making sense. Uh, Stalin's image of Ukrainians was twofold. They are primarily the peasant nation, but they're also the nation which is divided by state borders. So when you deal with the Ukrainians in the former Russian Empire, you should never forget that there are other Ukrainians outside of the former Russian Empire. And those other Ukrainians are, of course, evil nationalists. So there is then a significant difference between the treatment of Russian peasants and Ukrainian peasants, which shows from the very first days of the Soviet power in Ukraine. When you deal with the Ukrainian issue, it is from the start an international issue. It is the issue of Ukraine irredenta or unredeemed, Ukraine divided into several parts, and the theoretical possibility, and of course the desirability for Stalinist politics, of uniting those components of the Ukrainian nation under the red flag. But together with the opportunity, it also created considerable threat. So it would be possible for the Soviet Union to argue that Ukrainians received the best treatment in the Soviet Union, but they would have to pretend that there is some kind of a treatment specific to Ukrainians. And that explains Ukrainization to a significant degree. But also, if Soviet Ukraine can be, held, can be held out as an example to Ukrainians living abroad, it then also is true that Ukrainians living abroad can serve as an example to Soviet Ukrainians. That would mean the contamination of the national body, which would need to be cleansed. Perhaps the best comparison here is, in fact, Stalinist policies after World War II towards the Soviet Jews. When the leadership of the Soviet Jewish cultural movement was, in fact, eliminated, cultural institutions closed, the Jews, however, were not killed en masse. It was a cultural genocide. But cultural genocide uh, moved, as we think, uh, at least in the opinion of my colleague, Jeff Weidlinger, which I do share in this respect, moved by the fear of the diaspora, uh, by the fear of Soviet Jews actually having the real homeland now in Israel and therefore not being loyal Soviet citizens. Well, that comparison allows us to understand that part of my argument about Ukrainians as well. So there was a way to be a patriotic Ukrainian oriented towards the centers of Ukrainian life abroad in Czechoslovakia, Poland, perhaps even in Vienna. Therefore, Ukrainians were in a peculiar position, in a position in which basically all of them could be seen potentially as traitors. <laughs>
And so then the understanding of the peasant nation and peasant resistance and concessions the peasants forced then became combined with the notion of Ukraine as Irredenta, as a problematic threatening entity within the Soviet Union, which forces the Soviet leadership to provide continued concessions to the Ukrainians because they're also Ukrainians abroad. That's a situation which has quite a few tensions built into it, and Stalin understood them perfectly well. So, we get signals early on from the early 1920s that the Soviet leadership wanted in particular to demonize the Ukrainian political parties that represented the interests of the peasantry. Right after the conclusion of the Soviet-Polish war, a show trial is organized at which the leadership of the Ukrainian Party of Socialist Revolutionaries, which was in many ways um, the most influential party of the Ukrainian revolution, not the leading party actually, the Social Democrats provided most of the leadership, but the Socialist Revolutionaries had more support among the peasantry. They do not get killed yet in the early 1920s, but they are put on trial, and it is really important for the Soviets to organize this show trial. And in fact, as we move into the 1920s and early 30s, there will be more show trials organized. Very famously, in 1930, perhaps very infamously, the trial of the Union for the Liberation of Ukraine, which did not result in death sentences. Also, quite a few of those convicted ended up, in fact, being executed later on as an additional sentence imposed already in the camps. But this trial targeted a very specific group of Ukrainian elites, those associated directly with an anti-imperialist movement of the 1900s and the 1910s. So when uh, we speak in Ukrainian studies of the executed Renaissance, um, it very often feels like we need to specify. That's a well-accepted term originating from an anthology of Ukrainian writing uh, compiled um, abroad. But the executed Renaissance, which is meant there, is the one produced by the revolution itself. What is missing in our picture is that the repressions against Ukrainians went on before that. In 1930, at the show trial held at the Opera House in Kharkiv, some representatives of the future executed Renaissance, in fact, served um, as a public commentators on those being put on trial, the representatives of the previous generation. So the writer Alexa Slisarenko, uh, the writer Mikola Khvilevy, in fact, denounced those on trial as enemies. Therefore, it's not a single executed renaissance, but it is really a few waves of attack on Ukrainian culture and political elites. And why the attacks on Ukrainian elites would be important here in our understanding of the Holodomor and its consequences. I don't normally, as a social historian and cultural historian, focus too much on the elites, which is something historians in Ukraine today love doing. And they built uh, their theories on, on the views of Yacheslav Lipinski, the prominent theoretician from the early 20th century, a conservative thinker um, in the Polish tradition, in fact, in the European tradition, I have to say, studied in France and Germany. But I always felt that there was a disconnect and a very significant one between the conservative views of Lipinski and the actual left of the center Ukrainian revolution, which was led, for, led by the parties of Ukrainian socialist revolutionaries and social democrats. However, if we start the investigation in the way we have started it today, the loss of elites or the killing of Ukrainian elites um, is seen in a new light. And that's because it returns us to the tradition of the Russian Empire, in which the Ukrainians were the peasants. And those believing in the separateness of Ukrainian nation were foreign agents. Interestingly enough, that's precisely the view which Stalin is restoring in the 1930s. But there is more. 
And that is perhaps the central argument of my talk today. And that is the Stalinist actions of the 1930s allowed the return of a something called Little Russianism, which is defined culturally and politically as trying to fit within a larger imperial structure, the Russian one, while acknowledging Ukrainian cultural separateness, but not political separateness. Little Russia was the official Tsarist name of Ukraine. Little Russians was the official Tsarist term for Ukrainians. And it was perfectly possible to be a Little Russian, a regional patriot, and yet a strong supporter of the Tsar of the uh, monarchy. So now then, with this political component eliminated from the Ukrainian movement and from Ukrainian culture, what Stalin was in fact doing with his attacks on Ukrainian politicians and cultural figures that coincided very closely with the deadly attacks on the peasantry, he was in fact bringing back the very recognizable little Russianism. And that's not my invention, of course. The contemporaries saw it right away. Alexander Shumsky, in particular, but also to some degree Mikola Khvilevi, also not with the same gravity, because Shumsky was, after all, uh, an important politician, and Khvilevi was a popular writer, but not a politician. But both of them emphasized that the Soviets were actually restoring the colonial situation, without calling it such in most cases, that Ukrainians were being remade back into the little Russians of the Tsarist time, and that the loss of Ukrainian political ideology and the cultural component that emphasized the rights of the nation, in fact, returned Ukraine into the Tsarist fold. And therefore, it is not surprising that under Stalin in the 1930s, the Tsarist concept of the, of the three groups of the great Russian nation makes a return in the concept of reunification of Ukraine with Russia. So the Tsarist concepts are coming back, and they're coming back for a good reason, because that's precisely what Stalin's project is. So in this way, the 1954 document, the Central Committee's see this about the 300th anniversary of reunification of Ukraine with Russia, actually completes the Holodomor. And that's I understand is a difficult proposition, but it is, in fact, an important one for understanding what kind of a cultural and political structure Stalin wanted to create in Ukraine. There are multiple evidence of him trying to paint modernity as exclusively Soviet and Russian. Just think about the role of the tractor. The MTS, the machine tractor stations in the countryside were such an important component of violent collectivization that they, in fact, beginning in January 1933 at the height of the Holodomor, were provided with ideological sections. So when one particular institution in the countryside represents Soviet modernity and has a function of ideological control an ideological education that's not just about repairing tractors, really, and keeping them running. It is about modernity arriving in a particular form and shape, the Bolshevik and the Russian-speaking shape. So contemporaries saw right away that lit Russianism was making a return. Shumsky, in exile, uh, was writing a book about it, a book which he eventually uh, destroyed in 1946 before being killed by secret agents of Stalin's police. Shumsky in particular identified Khrushchev as the principal agent of little Russianism in Ukraine, and he had a very good reason to do so. During the Great Terror in 1937, Stalin's previous envoy in the Ukrainian Republic Pavel Postashev, we have just talked about him in connection with moving the capital, was accused of all kinds of ideological mistakes and eventually, of course, executed. 
But he did make an attempt to defend himself at the plenary meeting of the Central Committee in 1937. There, he claimed that one of his biggest mistakes was not studying Ukrainian language and Ukrainian history, not knowing it. That really explained all of his mistakes. He wasn't able to manage the nationalists properly because he didn't know enough about nationalism. Compare this to a situation just one year later, in early 1938, when Stalin invited Khrushchev to his office to discuss Khrushchev's appointment as a party boss in Ukraine. Khrushchev's first objection, a tentative objection, was in fact that he didn't know the Ukrainian language. But that, to Stalin, was not a factor at all. In fact, it was now perfectly fine for the new leader of Ukraine to not be able to give speeches in Ukrainian. And that is because Khrushchev moved to Ukraine with a very clear agenda of Russification. With his arrival, with his arrival, a series of decisions were taken that increased greatly the number of newspapers published in Russian and Ukraine in the regional centers and significantly increased the number of hours of the, Ukrainian, of the um, Russian language instruction in Ukrainian schools. It would, of course, be wrong to credit everything to Khrushchev. He was really solidifying the trends already appearing in previous years. And one of the biggest event, events of the previous years was, in fact, the celebration of Alexander Pushkin's death. That's one thing about Russian culture. They're really fond of killing their poets and then celebrating the anniversaries of death. Um, now, the celebration of Pushkin's death um, spelled over two years. It actually started in 1936 and continued in 1937, the actual um, 100th anniversary. On that occasion, all the nations of the Soviet Union were made to read his poetry and prose and celebrate him as the greatest Russian writer of all times. Numerous monuments went up around the country. Schools were renamed after him and streets as well. Obviously, Pushkin was not a Bolshevik. In fact, his own ideological views are rather ambivalent. He celebrated the conquest of Poland while at the same time being supportive of some Russian liberals, but the Russian liberals he was supporting were also empire builders at the same time. So kind of peculiar thing. But it's really not about his personality at all. It's about the fact that he is a single most recognizable symbol of Russian culture. So building monuments to him and uh, naming streets and schools after him was in fact about reconfirming the importance of the Russian tradition for the entire Soviet Union. And eventually, after World War II, for the countries of the Eastern Bloc. So now, when Ukraine right now actually is in the process of getting rid of Pushkin monuments and Pushkin streets and whatever, uh, some interesting research was done by my colleagues uh, that the monuments and names stop very clearly at the border between East Germany and West Germany. And that means celebrating Pushkin was not about literature or the alleged literary greatness of that particular figure. It was about acknowledging the guidance, cultural and political, of the elder Russian brother. And that begins in 1936-37. It also means we need to reevaluate the Ukrainization as well. And that process is already underway. A number of colleagues in Ukraine are working on this because for a long time, I think, researchers in the West were buying into the explanation provided by the Bolsheviks themselves that they were so committed to destroying the colonial legacy that they wanted to organize the affirmative action programs for all the national minorities in the country. Here's the thing though, somehow only in Ukraine this program was implemented to any significant degree. But of course, it was also in Ukraine where this program was undone in the most violent and comprehensive way under Stalin, starting with the times of the Holodomor. So it does look like uh, it was not really about Bolshevik's inner convictions about fighting the colonial legacy, but more of a 
concession to the powerful Ukrainian peasantry. And after the period of concessions was over with the Holodomor, Ukrainization could be abolished, not formally, but informally. Why not formally? Indeed, why not? Stalin had done a number of crazy things, like not, not holding party congresses for over a decade, like violating every Bolshevik prescription, all kinds of rules of class analysis. But somehow that one was observed. There was no official degree about abolishing Ukrainization. And the answer is, of course, in the second component constituting or constitutive of the Ukrainian nation, according to the Bolsheviks the irredentist component, the presence of the Ukrainian diaspora, as we would say today, abroad. So Khrushchev came and instituted all these programs, but then Stalin concluded his pact with Hitler and divided Poland in 1939. And under the circumstances, the original rationale for Ukrainization became even more important, de facto, the policies of Ukrainization were being abandoned right and left and center. And by the way, it's really interesting that the signal for abandonment of these policies came in a rather obscure form of a decree about studying Ukrainian in the Russian Republic, rather than in some kind of blanket decree covering the entire Soviet Union, all of Soviet Ukraine. And of course, the importance of that decree is symbolic because the former imperial master now newly restored as a dominant force in the Soviet Union, could not be forced to accept Ukrainization as well. Those Ukrainians living in Russia were supposed now, just like under the Tsars, to assimilate. It was a signal. It was not applied to Ukraine itself formally, but applied informally. But then the problem is the Soviet tanks, of course, rolled cross the border and occupy significant territories in Eastern Europe populated by Ukrainians. What does it mean? It means that Khrushchev has to actually stop his program of assimilation. He didn't leave us any account of his feelings at that moment in his rather revealing memoir. There is almost nothing really about his relation to Ukrainian culture in general, other than claiming to have saved two Ukrainian poets who also believed they were being saved by Khrushchev. But of course, as a literary metaphor or perhaps a psychological um, concept, the feeling of being saved by a party leader is really the recognition of your own fear. And the fact that you considered your own identity um, criminal to start with, if you needed to be saved. So Khrushchev has to abandon the wonderful program of assimilation because the Soviet state now needs to incorporate those Ukrainians from abroad. And that proves to be a very difficult task. Not much is accomplished until June 1941, when Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union finally face each other. And in fact, when after World War II, Khrushchev is back to this project of redefining the Ukrainian nation. The moment of the greatest tension comes again when he has to deal with the peasantry. The collectivization policies are extended into Galicia only in 1947. 1947 also becomes the year of greatest resistance in the countryside. Up to that point, the cities are, in particular, Lemberg, Lvov, Lviv, Lvov, are actually Russified in the late 1940s. They're primarily not Russian speaking, populated by the Soviet elites arriving from Russia or from Eastern Ukraine. But after this resistance to collectivization, the Soviets actually take measures to institute again the programs of education in Ukrainian. And here, an interesting diversion occurs between Ukraine and Belarus, which sort of explains why Belarus is a dictatorship today and why Ukraine is, in fact, fighting against Russia on behalf of the democratic world. And that is that in Belarus, there was no nationalist insurgency supported by the peasantry, which was antagonized by the collectivization. So the insurgency was suppressed. The peasantry was crushed. But the Soviets 
remembered that now they needed Ukrainization. And so around 1950, they abandoned the policies of direct assimilation in that part of Ukraine and institute the Ukrainian press. In Belarus, that did not happen. It was assimilated right away. The part of Belarus annexed from Poland was assimilated right away. There was no nationalist resistance connected to the peasantry. And of course, it only confirms that the Soviets were following the same logic after World War II as well, that they are facing the resistance from the peasant masses that needs to be somehow connected to the nationalists. And therefore, an attack on both these groups was necessary, and also some kind of a program which would allow the Soviets to claim that they keep satisfying the national aspirations of the group. So they really did it under duress. So it was not part of a decolonization drive, because otherwise Belarus now would have been a very different nation. It was then a result of resistance on the part of the peasantry, which extended the life of Ukrainization. And then ironically, it meant that Khrushchev didn't have a free hand to create his, you know, dreamed of Ukrainian nation until the 1950s. And in the late 1950s, he does begin a program of assimilation throughout the Soviet Union. The Russian language is pushed um, at schools. The passport nationality of Russians is now prioritized over any other groups. And parents are only happy to, to switch the passport nationality of their children to Russian and such. Now, what this means, of course, is that the Holodomor, in this particular scheme of things, is really a crucial juncture of Soviet policies in two major fields towards agriculture, private ownership and agriculture, and towards the non-Russian cultures. Then the Soviets also attempt to institute similar policies elsewhere, but they are being very careful because peasant resistance continues on an unprecedented scale after World War II. It also means that the project of reshaping the Ukrainian nation remains incomplete. And as soon as the Soviet regime liberalizes the ideological atmosphere in the country in the late 1980s, the question that comes back right away is the question of the Ukrainian language. It is actually the subject of the very first public rally in Ukraine organized independently from the, from the state in 1988 in the city of, of course, Lviv, where else. And so the demands for the Ukrainian language rights and culture rights become central at that moment of revival when the Ukrainian nation is reconstructed now by democratic activists. And so precisely because Stalin wanted to destroy the Ukrainian nation in this way, and Khrushchev inherited this project, but could not complete it because of the armed resistance, because also of the Cold War, you know, all kinds of implications for foreign policy. That's precisely why the democratic activists of the 1980s went back to that point. To which point? Two of them, actually. The Holodomor and the national culture. Because at that very same time, when the first rally was devoted to the rights of the Ukrainian language, the awareness of the Holodomor was being raised by the very same democratic activists and writers in Ukraine. And even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, the party authorities in Ukraine are forced into the discussion of the Holodomor, the term itself is not yet used in, uh, within the Soviet Union, but they are definitely forced into the discussion of the famine, something they completely ignore and, in fact, protest in 1983 for the 50th anniversary of the famine. But now, only a few years later, they are forced into looking into party documents and acknowledging this at first as mistakes and very soon as a repressive policy of the Stalinist regime. So these two issues then return together in the very same way as they were in fact, handled together by Stalin, by Lenin, Stalin, and Khrushchev. And why they, while returning together, they also create a basis for something new and very important, for the new historical consciousness which separates 
today, the people fighting on the Ukrainian side of the front in the Donbas and elsewhere, and those on the Russian side. Now, the language itself may not be a clear criterion, but what, of course, sociological research now shows is that patriotic Ukrainians now recognize the importance of Ukrainian language, even if they don't actually speak it yet at home, but they recognize it as an important symbol of the nation. And the Holodomor, too, became the most important um, memory tool, mnemonic tool, for the construction of new Ukrainian nation. Because finding out about Holodomor, being able to talk about the Holodomor, created a certain understanding of what the Soviet regime was all about. And again, that's precisely the thing which sociologists report was very notable um, in dividing the people on both sides of the front in the Donbass beginning in 2014. Those on the Russian and pro-Russian side believed that Stalin was a great leader. And the Soviet legacy was wonderful. Those, however, on the Ukrainian side understood that Stalin was a bloodthirsty tyrant and that the Soviet legacy was, in fact, the legacy of empire and totalitarianism. And so in the way these two issues then were linked by the Bolshevik leaders and pursued by them together in order to crush the Ukrainian nation, they became, in fact, the vehicle for its restoration in the age of democracy and people power, which continues the fight, as you know, continues to this day. Thank you so much. We can now take a few questions. Thank you very much, Sehe, for a fascinating discussion and uh, really overview of 20th century Ukrainian history, isn't it, and the way in which a little more fits into this narrative. So uh, as you know, because uh, you were kind enough to review my work, um, my own scholarship advanced the notion that the Soviets don't just abandon Ukrainianization because they don't view it as necessary anymore, but that it in fact represents a danger that they can't control. It's sort of genie that's led out of the bottle where the sort of essential script is given to Ukrainizers and then they take the cue but run it, run it uh, according to their own course. And I wonder if in any way that can fit into our understanding of the Holodomor, your understanding of the Holodomor, in the sense that um, the Ukrainization, as I tried to argue against Terry Martin, uh, was problematic, particularly in schools. Um, it wasn't an easy, an easy endeavor. It still threatened the notion that modernity would be defined as Ukrainian and not Russian. And as you've posited here, that is antithetical to Stalin's position, and it's a position to which he returned. So I'm wondering if you might comment on that. It's not just something that needs to be abandoned because it was never really invested with any authority over the long term that the Bolsheviks were willing to consign it, but that it in fact represented a real danger to the Soviet project. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. And of course, your excellent book on the Ukrainian language at school and um, informs much of what I'm going to say in this talk. And I think it really functioned by way of sending signals more than actually instituting very clear policies. And the well-known well example is that Stalin constantly worried about the teaching of Russian in Ukrainian schools, but he seems to be, you know, seems to have been confused about it fundamentally. So he didn't realize that the language was already taught. And then he sends a telegram asking, so is it taught and how many hours and report it to me immediately. So he doesn't really say switch to Russian right away starting tomorrow. But when you receive a telegram like that from Stalin, of course, we can all imagine what kind of in effect it's going to have on Ukrainian bureaucracies. 
My colleagues in Ukraine now, those working on the Ukrainization, Hennady Yefimenko in particular is doing very interesting work on it, as, as you know. Um, and then now we'll talk about the two different Ukrainizations, the official one and the popular one. I'm not quite sure if I buy into this because it uh, sort of uh, creates the notion that the masses rushed in. Uh, but it was, I think, more complex. Um, I think the official policies reala really allowed an opening to the Ukrainian elites emerging from, from the Ukrainian revolution. Those who already really compromised themselves to some degree by denouncing the previous generation of Ukrainian elites in, in 1930, and now projecting the socialist Ukrainian modernity in the form of Ukrainization. So they were the ones pushing through. And of course, Mikola Skripnik is a most notable example, which of course the Ukrainian authorities now don't know how to evaluate um, in terms of decommunization policies, because clearly he was an important Bolshevik official who participated in the persecution of Ukrainian cultural figures, but he also made a major contribution to Ukrainian culture, which is the clause exempting a person um, from uh, decommunization policies. So really difficult to figure out how he fits there. So I think, I think the real uh, thing is that Ukraine did have a significant group of national elites who wanted to push the agenda of Ukrainization. So basically took it and ran away with it. It's not that the masses somehow organized spontaneously and rushed in demanding more Ukrainization. The masses obviously enjoyed the possibility of you know, being able to study in the native language and such. But of course, we shouldn't idealize the masses either. <laughs> Quite a few people um, uh, in, uh, still held the views common in Tsarist Russia, as the Orthodox Christians, us and Russians. And of course, you, we see these attitudes during World War II, in much of Ukraine, we see, in much of Eastern and Central Ukraine, we see the same attitudes even in the Donbass in most recent times. You know, the notion of us including them. And that's the Tsarist notion, really, the Eastern Slavic community of Orthodox Christians. So the masses, the masses are not holders of a golden standard of Ukrainian identity, but it is a group of activists, writers, and politicians who push for a more expansive Ukrainization, and they do possess the political language to define the project. Um, and that is, I think, um, an addition to the great work that Terry Martin has done, and you have done as well, that uh, these people appropriated the language of decolonization without using the term uh, colonial empire all that, often, all that often, but nevertheless, it became clear to Stalin and others in Moscow that they released that genie, you know, they really allowed, allowed the platform for resistance. And once that platform was seized by the Ukrainian elites, it actually created political danger, which is something to be expected. And of course, the uh, problematic um, part of this whole argument about Ukrainization is also that the Ukrainian case is really the only one which is fully developed. At, and Terry Martin recognizes that in his book, too that you know, it was theoretically applicable to all kinds of other cases, but the one fully developed was in fact Ukraine. And interestingly enough, for other national minorities, the Polish and German and Jewish in Ukraine, they received um, more cultural rights and, and such than anywhere else in the Soviet Union. So Ukraine does appear to be a very specific case for a variety of reasons, and we know perfectly well these reasons. The peasants, peasant resistance, being close to the border, being part of a redentist movement and such. So I think you're right. Um, it's, it's, it's a complex issue which is not well served by presenting a dichotomy between a popular Ukrainization and an official one. The official one itself uh, was um, complex and hybrid, really, and included the trend which emphasized also the right for autonomy, economic autonomy as well as political one. Sergei, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. It was magnificent. Um, your lecture has me thinking um, in new ways about two silences, and I hope that you can maybe uh, think about them as well and, and offer your own interpretation. And the silences I have in mind are those in Khrushchev's um, so-called secret speech in 1956 in the 20th Party Congress, uh, 
Um, the silence about Holodomor and the silence also about the deportation of the Crimean Tatars of all the litanized crimes of Stalinism that uh, Khrushchev enumerates in that speech. Those are two really glaring absences. And I'm just wondering what you make of that absence and that silence. Why uh, reserve any comments or expose or fail to expose um, Holodomor before um, uh, the Party Congress alongside the deportation of the Crimean Tatars. What made those two events um, different in some way? Um, I'm wondering if you can comment about, about that. That's a great question, um, Rory. They also differ you know, between themselves as well. Uh, not only they're in a separate category of their own, but there are significant differences between these two cases too. My explanation about the Holodomor would actually be a pretty straightforward. It is the connection to the collectivization. So the moment you try to revise the notion of the collectivization, that really means revising the existing social order in the Soviet Union under Khrushchev. You suddenly need to return land to the peasants and you know, give them freedom to, to leave the countryside and become workers, increase the small plots of land they have been eventually allowed and such. So it's a, it actually means questioning the foundational social um, phenomenon of the Soviet order. And the consequences would be innumerable. Even decolocalization itself um, could only mildly be criticized. And the reason for that is that Stalin was himself the one who criticized the policies of decolocalization. When, um, he published this infamous or famous article, Dizzy with Success or Dizziness with Success. So he himself said that, you know, an attack on the richer peasants was overdone and it was wrong. So that really created an opening which allowed his successors to criticize in a mild form decolocalization. But I think the famine would have been really the event which would destroy the Soviet story of collectivization completely. That's what I think. Now, about the Crimean Tatars, it's a much more complex issue, which I don't quite know how to solve. But um, one consideration there would be this. Um, Khrushchev wanted to uh, bring Crimea into the administrative borders of Ukraine right away in 1944. There is a folder at the um, Central Party Archive, the former Party Archive in Kiev, with all kinds of statistical data about Crimea uh, dated 1944. And that means there was a good reason that they were collecting, because that's the precise moment when Khrushchev was collecting um, the data and letters of support from other regions that he hopes to um, annex, including the regions which, of course, end up not being annexed, uh, such as Holm, Helm uh, in Poland and others. So there is actually there are all the files and the reports and the kind of petitions, please bring us into Soviet Ukraine. But eventually that decision is taken by Stalin and they do not, uh, of course, include them. But it looks like Khrushchev was preparing the materials for all of this um, annexations. But Crimea, of course, for him, would have presented a very interesting dilemma and a possibility. The dilemma would be whether to Ukrainianize it, and if so, to what degree. And the, what to do with the ethnic Russians who moved into Crimea between the revolution and World War II, and those who moved after 1944. Um, whether it would be a possibility for Ukraine or whether it would be a liability for Ukraine. And it has been argued by some political scientists that perhaps it was one consideration in Khrushchev's mind and or even Stalin's mind to balance Ukraine in some way because the Ukrainian newly acquired West was nationalistic with the underground movement and uh, um, the insurgents in the forests, all these kinds of things. So the acquisition of the primarily Russian now after the deportation of the primarily now Russian Crimea would balance it off so that Ukraine would not appear to be this uh, problematic, dangerous place where you could expect treason everywhere. And of course, um, that would mean that 
you know, you cannot antagonize that very Russian community, which included a significant proportion of ethnic Ukrainians too. I do have an article actually about that. Um, and it's a well-established point that the 24% of ethnic Ukrainians living in uh, Crimea became politically mobilized as Russians um, under the threat of the Crimean Tatars returning and also under the threat of the Ukrainian language being suddenly introduced with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so it's, um, you know, an example of constructed nationalities here. Uh, ethnic Ukrainians, as they did, by the way, in Transnistria, politically mobilizing as Russians, quote unquote. Um, but in, in the greater scheme of things, <laughs> it still needed to be defined in some way. So in the 1950s, Ukraine, and how I know it is I, I was, I served as an external on a dissertation defended in New Zealand on that topic. Um, so in the 1950s, Ukrainian officials at the level of Minister of Education or kind of second or third secretary of the Central Committee travel there and give assurances in public meetings that no Ukrainization is going to be instituted. And then an informal ban on the term Ukrainization is actually established in the Crimea. So all the officials know that and of course, the locals, they appropriate this term too. So in meetings with Ukrainian officials, the locals, um, and I guess not, not the ordinary people from the street, but actually the representatives of the local elites, they use it as potential leverage against, against any Ukrainian threat, saying, are you going to introduce Ukrainization here? You all know what Ukrainization ended up with, being a nationalist, badly writing Ukrainization. And so this term itself is banned. It's only high officials arriving from Kyiv who can say, we are not going to introduce it. And then, of course, what it means is that Crimea remains a dilemma for Ukraine precisely because um, there is no way of um, not that Ukrainian officials really wanted it, I don't imagine they did. There is no way of solving solving the uh, Tatar question without antagonizing the Crimeans, or at least they see it this way, I think. And uh, and of course, this issue also has a rather strong racist connotations. And so many of us who traveled. Uh, to the Crimea, which I did uh, for, I think, nine consecutive summers as a school child. Uh, you, you heard a lot of statements about the Crimean Tatars that uh, today would sound very clearly racist to me as a historian. And actually, there were Crimean Tatars around, which is, I think, some, some people assume that there were no Crimean Tatars on the ground, but they were some. But they behaved also in a very interesting way and being very careful, but at the same time trying to be very open and friendly, uh, kind of to signal that they are not the threat. And yet, of course, they were made into political threat again in the 1990s. So I think Khrushchev was kind of facing an impossible political dilemma where one choice is better and the other is even worse, and it's better not to take any action at all on this issue. Uh, thank you, Sergei, for the very interesting uh, uh, lecture, actually, uh, keynote lecture. Um, Shumsky is, is very interesting, and I, I, I uh, have been recently in Spain uh, at a conference in, at the University of Granada on European feminists, and, and Shapoval and, uh, and Filip Slavesky actually uh, said that they are preparing a biography of, of Shumsky that would be published, I think, next year. And I think it will be a very uh, important contribution to understanding the Ukrainian question in in, uh, in Soviet Union, actually, 36, why they decided, namely in 46, to kill Shumsky. It's, it's very, very interesting. But I have two uh, very punctual uh, questions to you. First of all, do you see a connection between moving the capital from Kharkiv to Kiev immediately after the Holodomor? And the fact that uh, Kyiv province, Kyiv, Kyiv oblast, was among uh, those regions that suffered most from the uh, famine in terms of excess mortality. And the second question 
more complicated probably. But very interesting uh, to compare the anti-Ukrainian campaign of the uh, Holodomor years, let's say, December 32 and the next months with the anti-Ukrainian campaign, anti-nationalist campaign uh, of the early 70s. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And it's also a pleasure to meet in person, right? After being friends on Facebook for so long, I think, what is, what is the term in Ukrainian for this? Ros virtuality, some kind of, you know, <laughs> leave virtual reality and actually meet each other in real life. Um, thank you for great questions. Yes, um, this biography was published in Ukraine quite a while ago. Yeah, I know. Uh, I cannot reveal how I know, but I was involved at some at some stage. But but of course, the biography and the collection of documents about Shumsky is available. It's on the internet, um, and of course, the book in English, which is co-authored um, with another academic, um, is very different. Um, or rather, it kind of combines the chapters coming from the original Ukrainian text and the new ones. And the new ones, to me. Uh, were quite interesting too. Um, Shumsky, of course, is um, in many ways important, if only because if in 1926 Stalin makes him an example of what uh, Ukrainian politicians should not do, when Shumsky famously demanded during the meeting with Stalin that an ethnic Ukrainian should now lead uh, the Ukrainian party organization and the Ukrainian Council of uh, People's Commissars. So it's, it's a difficult person to rehabilitate as well, given the decommunization legislation and such. Uh, but he represents a valuable story of the Ukrainian revolution himself as a socialist revolutionary, borrowed based eventually a Bolshevik because of his positions, because of his position. So it's, it's, it's a great story and I do hope the book is going to be published soon. Kyiv targeted, yes. Uh, the Kyiv province and or oblast, or the Kharkiv oblast, of course, are the ones that are not as important agriculturally for that particular uh, uh, type of agricultural production, but important politically. And so, indeed, it makes perfect sense. And I would also think that the connecting uh, link here would be that the authorities in these oblasts would be particularly eager to demonstrate how well they are fighting against the nationalists. Um, and so they perhaps invested into, into producing higher figures as well. Now, the issue of Kyiv becoming a capital um, is connected to a variety of factors. And I've published an article about that when I was still a graduate student. And of course, that's the whole thing about the articles you publish as a graduate student, that you constantly want to rewrite them, right? <laughs> so it focused primarily on the social project of making Kyiv a proletarian city, and that's, that's the name of the, the title of the article. But um, at the time, I thought that the primary consideration was, and I think Professor Bruski is going to agree, the Soviet-Polish pact, because um, the Soviet policies in right bank Ukraine, in the uh, uh, territories west of the Dnieper, um, included an informal prohibition on building major industrial enterprises. Because the contemporary strategic thinking, military thinking in the 1920s, had been that uh, they would not be able to stop the enemy until the Dnieper line. And that explains the construction of the Stalin line, which is exactly around Dnieper, which then um, easily overtaken by the Germans in World War II and such. So there were military strategic reasons for that, and they were thinking that perhaps an attack that would come, of course, from Poland, where else, <laughs> would in fact result in occupying uh, the entire part um, of, of Soviet Ukraine up to the Dnieper. And of course, Kyiv back then was in its entirety on the high uh, western bank of the Dnieper. Because the, the left, left bank of the river still belongs to a different province even. And so, in this sense, uh, the Soviet-Polish pact actually was one factor which allowed the Soviets more um, freedom from the point of view of security to take the capital back. But also, there's plenty of other things. Um, the anti-religious campaigns, uh, the destruction of the Ukrainian churches, uh, Orthodox Church in particular, um, massive cleansings of former exploiting classes, so-called exploiting classes, which could include priests and police officers and army officers, families of 
uh, officials. The massive cleansing of Kyiv was also pursued um, right after the capital was moved, according to the new passport regulations in force from 1932, but apparently not really fully applied in Kyiv up to that point. So I wonder whether we need to revise our understanding of Soviet passport campaign as well on this occasion. So there are plenty of things that go into it, and including international considerations. But I do think that the factor revealed um, revealed by Postashov is in fact the central one, except it was revealed in such a language that we need to decipher it. It's all about the national cultural construction. That it's about defining the nation ultimately. Um, and anti Ukrainian campaigns of the 1970s, oh, yes, absolutely. And actually, the early 1960s as well, 1963, arrests of Ukrainian intellectuals are trying to produce again um, a certain type of Ukrainian intellectual who would celebrate the Soviet power. But here, of course, they run into trouble because every time there is a relaxation of political regime, those very same reliable poets who were writing songs about Stalin for decades turn around and say, wait a minute, how about the rights of the Ukrainian language? That's exactly what is happening in 1953. Again, in 1956, uh, after Khrushchev's uh, secret report, and in 1953, in connection with Beria's, uh, with Beria initiating this well-known campaign of um, bringing the natives to leadership positions and national republics and um, uh, creating the impression that no assimilationist policies are being pursued, which of course results in the Ukrainian party leader, Comrade Malenkov, losing his position and then the entire succession of ethnic Ukrainians leading the republic. But it's, it's, it's quite a long story, but ultimately the Soviet regime was constantly disciplining Ukrainian intellectuals because they discovered that it was in fact impossible. After the moment when you recognized uh, the separateness of Ukrainian nation um, to create um, an obedient variety of a Soviet Ukrainian intellectual because the very notion of being uh, a Soviet Ukrainian intellectual involved uh, the production of a separate and theoretically equal national culture. So in the 1970s and there is a push for assimilation and also the push for um, really restoring the Tsarist understanding of the kind of three concepts, three, three uh, tribes of the old Russian nation. And I think they come closest uh, two moments, the late 1950s, when the assimilation is being pushed at school. But that, I believe, is around the Soviet Union in other republics as well. And the 1970s is more like, Ukraine-specific or perhaps specific to the Western republics of the Soviet Union. Um, and then, of course, there is a inf the serious influence of the Polish example, too. Like the Hungarian example, 1956, uh, 1968, um, in parts of Europe, and, of course, the Polish example of 1980-81, they do resonate in Ukraine uh, fairly strongly, especially in the western part of the country where you can get the broadcasts and where, you know, people um, have um, cultural heritage which allows them to fully comprehend uh, kind of complex concepts in Polish, which we in Kyiv don't necessarily have. So I understand about three, three quarters, but um, I cannot really, um, I cannot really, you know, deal with serious political matters in Polish. So um, in many ways, this argument about being a Soviet Western Republic was being redone over and over again by first Professor Sporluk, um, then Amir Weiner, um, and then several more people, and including a colleague who apparently recently received a position at Oxford teaching Soviet history. So uh, the Soviet West is an interesting region. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm just really taking so much time to answer. I apologize for that. Hi, Serhi. Thank you so much for your talk. There is a lot to think about. Um, and I wanted to follow up with this linkage between the Holodomor and national identity. So what you've just been talking about is a great dovetail, because I've also seen um, in contemporary Ukraine this linkage between not only Holodomor as a nation building narrative, but also as a form of separating Ukrainianness from, from Russia. And um, a thread that I'm often pulling on there is if we understand this linkage, as, as you've said, between the Holodomor and national identity, 
How do we understand the decades of enforced forgetting of the Holodomor and its effect on broader Ukrainian identity during the decades following the Holodomor? So, um, you know, all of these decades were very different. The Soviet Union was not monolithic as we know in this room, but the one consistency was that it was an officially forbidden topic. And over time, there was this process of some families preserving the memory and some not preserving the memory. And so when I think about one conversation I had, it's a pattern that won't surprise this room, but I, I talked with a man who said that he grew up in the Soviet Union when he was 14, he was the age to know the family secrets. And so the two family secrets that he was told was that it was about the Holodomor and it was about the fact that he was actually Ukrainian and he didn't know. Um, and he said that it was very shocking for him, hard for him to accept that he was Ukrainian. And then he said, when I accepted that I was Ukrainian, then I understood that the famine had happened. And so I know we've all heard this pattern, but, but could you speak more about the connection of this enforced forgetting over decades in the Soviet Union? That's a very complex issue because it touches upon the issue of Soviet subjectivity, which back in the 1990s and early 2000s was really pushed by a group of excellent, very smart colleagues in the field. I happen to disagree with this notion completely, but they do acknowledge that the argument was fairly complex. Um, now, then if, if we invest so much into the notion of Soviet subjectivity and people actually being converted into good Soviets by following all the propaganda and all the restrictions, then it's not quite clear why the Soviet Union collapsed in the first place, really. And of course, the truth is, I think, more complex um, that there existed always in society an understanding that certain things should not be discussed in the open which didn't mean that they were not discussed in the family. So they could be discussed in the family with a provision that you shouldn't talk about that in the open. For instance, I always knew that my mom didn't know her grandparents on one side because they were decolocized and disappeared somewhere in Siberia or Soviet Arctic. But I just knew that I wasn't supposed to talk about it, really. And of course, the Soviet experience of World War II is something every family had lots of stories about, but there was a fairly clear understanding with various kind of landmarks that this you, talk, you can talk about, that you cannot really talk about. Um, campaigns of the 1950s, the doctor's plot, all kinds of other things um, involved um, the reversals of the official line, sometimes within a month which of course, you know, made a comedy of all those <laughs> concepts that the Soviet people were really so Soviet, they wonderfully believed in everything. You cannot, if you are told that these are the enemies and, and then the next month you're told, no, they are good, innocent people. The enemies are actually those ones. So I think all the good Soviets would have to commit suicide at that moment because of the inner conflict, right? So um, I'm more comfortable with um, the notion of kind of policed boundaries of discourse, right? Um, because in Soviet urban areas, everybody listens to Western radio broadcasts in the 1970s and 80s. You're just not supposed to discuss it at school. And I've actually made a mistake of saying at the political information meeting at school that, and by the way, uh, this and that uh, Soviet ideologue has just died. Turned out he didn't die yet. It's just the Western broadcast said that he was apparently dead. He actually died a week later. And so the teacher then said to my parents, like, well, you're not supposed to be revealing, you know, at school what you have learned from Western broadcasts. Right? And that was the end of, of that action, but it sort of, I think, shaped me as a historian in a variety of ways, right? So, um, so the, the, Sometimes inner policing of uh, discursive boundaries definitely takes place, but it doesn't get rid of family stories. Um, the official story of World War II is well known and by now completely mythologized, but the actual familial memory of World War II was always around and that involved, you know, being mobilized, not even given a rifle and being sent to die or whatever. So these cases were never forgotten. They were always known, just not discussed. And that then perfectly explains why um, Gorbachev's reforms became so powerful, unexpectedly for, I think, himself even, because he released those gates and then the, the, the uh, information flooded, uh, not just because people found out, people always knew, but now they could talk and that granted them power. 
And that's, I think, what happened with the Holodomor. By the way, um, there was no total denial in Soviet Ukraine. Also, we are right in saying that there was a total denial of the notion of the Holodomor as genocide. That was denied. But of course, there was always an acknowledgement of temporary difficulties with the produce and the countryside and things like that. And you know what it does? It basically indicates to Soviet citizens that there must have been a disaster. So if, if this is what you acknowledge, then it means it was truly a genocide. That we just cannot talk about it. And that's what familiar history uh, uh, supports, supports as well. And of course, that applies to present day Russia too, right? So if, uh, um, if, uh, if an official says that there's going to be a partial mobilization, and then, you know, people in Russia, of course, well attuned to uh, the policed boundaries of the discourse. And that means that there is going to be a real war and we are not doing well at all, right? That's not what the government says, but that's what it means. And this custom of interpreting uh, official uh, pronouncements is, is a very long one, which is not to dismiss your question, uh, because it's a very real and important question of what it does to you when, when you spend decades not openly talking about something. Right, and of course, there is a relatively recent example in European history of one particular state making it an official policy, really, not to talk about something, and that is Spain and the Spanish Civil War, and what uh, outcomes it produced for Spanish historical memory. Um, you can also say that perhaps in Germany, until the 1960s, the issue of the Holocaust was not discussed on, on a scale which it, it was since the 1960s especially 1980s. So there are examples of that. And not being able to talk about certain things does have psychological effects, I'm sure. I'm not a specialist on that. Uh, there are other specialists at this conference who know more, more about it. Uh, it's definitely frustrating, but family stories have a way of surviving, uh, especially, I think, in connection with cultural traditions, like cemetery visits, on which occasions stories are told about how that person died and why and what they were doing and this perennial existence of the division between us and them um, us as a deserving poor as the ordinary people who need to help each other and them the bosses who be a, being driven in limos around and um, who have domestic servants and who pretend to be good marxists so i don't think this division was ever erased it just continues to exist from Tsarist times and actually, if you want, there is a very interesting parallel with the famine of uh, 1892 in the Russian Empire, which really had very little reflection in Ukraine, um, in, in parts of southern Ukraine. But it was an important indication of how the state was lying about it, and everybody knew the state was lying. So, and I assume that Soviet ideologues were children uh, in the 1890s. And they remembered how the Tsarist government actually officially banned the term Golod, Golod in Russian, famine. It couldn't be used. So basically, the Soviets were doing the same thing. Um, and also, the famine of 1892 really helped mobilize the Russian society against the regime. So there are quite a few interesting historical lessons uh, and uh, continuity on a greater scale, too. Sorry for taking so much time to answer your great question and actually other questions too. I had a question related to uh, Terry Martin's work in, in, um, and I struggled to, to try and reconcile what he says in his conclusion regarding the nationalities issue, um, where he, he explained that while the nationalities issues help to explain both the pattern of terror and the role of, of the national factor during the famine, he argued that, that the requisitions campaign spared no grain producing region, but was applied in such a way that nationality was a, of minimal importance. Yet in, in the conclusion, uh, he conjoins the two elements of grain requisition terror and nationality nationalities terror as separate entities. Uh, he says the famine was not an intentional act of genocide, specific, specifically targeting the Ukrainian nation. It is equally false, however, to assert that the nationality played no role whatsoever in the famine. 
and I was wondering if you, if you could give your take on that and and whether or not it's important. It was a landmark book. It's a book which is 20 years old, uh, which represents a stage in our knowledge about uh, the Holodomor at which the scholars were really only digesting this information about the uh, Stalin's correspondence and decrees of 1932 in their relation to agricultural policies and the policing measures uh, during the famine. Um, and so he introduced important documentations and an important interpretive model uh, without, I think, fully applying it because it came as a next stage, truly. Um, the um, digitization of the archives and re-evaluation of the um, show trials on the Stalin, where it became extremely clear that the Soviets were trying to connect every political figure and every intellectual to somehow propagandizing the peasantry and being responsible for the peasant resistance. And that gives us a very clear clue that it was then a genocide in this scheme, because even if it were not the case, let's say Ukrainian intellectuals had no connection with the peasantry whatsoever, peasant rebellions were completely separate from whatever intellectual descent. Let's assume that for the moment. But the Soviet authorities believed otherwise and wanted to represent that as a picture to the world and, and the open citizenry. And so they kept connecting cultural and political purges to, to ultimately the power base of the Ukrainian idea, the peasantry. It's actually very interesting that the introduction of socialist realism as a method in Soviet art in Ukraine was directly connected to the famine and collectivization which has recently become a, an interesting subject for research because primarily of, of Sedlar's illustration to Taras Shevchenko Kobzar, which I think one of them was shown on, on, on a slide um, in this conference as well, uh, which of course had something to do with uh, modernizing Shevchenko's um, argument against slavery and presenting it as the peasants being controlled by the government. And in some of those illustrations, it is it looks like it's the Imperial Russian army uniforms who are beating up the peasantry. In one, at least, it looks like a Polish army. Uh, so Sedlar kind of brought it into the 20th century. And then, of course, the Soviet authorities decided that he was looking at them at the oven policies. And so that became a representation of the Holodomor, which I think also post facto really happened, not, not right at the time. And then uh, the Soviets looked at all the representations of the peasantry and visual arts. And by 1935, there was this entire trend of uh, Soviet artists producing paintings about happy life on collective farms. And it became an ultimate test of Ukrainian art, how you portray the collective farm which would seem to be perhaps unrelated, but it ultimately is. So if you are an Ukrainian artist, that must be the central question for you because we think it is a central question for Ukraine. So let's see how you are portraying the collective farms, right? And, and, and they did so. Um, it, so it, it kind of, all of this corpus of archival sources and uh, kind of little known aspects of Stalinization in different ways suddenly became clear because it all gravitated towards the central issue of how to treat the peasants, um, the collectivization, the decolocization, and the famine. So in the 1920s, um, a Soviet artists who work in uh, graphic arts and whatever, I wouldn't even know all the English terms required for that, they actually in the 1920s published something on the famine, but they meant the famine in capitalist countries. Then 1933 comes and all this 1920s work suddenly become subversive because they are now interpreted as dealing with Soviet famines. And of course, scholars say, well, uh, the people who produced them also survived the 1921 famine in Ukraine. So it is entirely possible that they were thinking about their own experience rather than the imagined capitalist countries where, of course, everybody is uh, dying of famine and such. So. Um, it became, I think, increasingly obvious in recent decades that that is the issue 
which uh, combines various threats in the Sovietization of Ukraine in all aspects of it, culture, politics, economy, social. Um, and it becomes increasingly difficult actually to deny the connection, also because that's precisely what defines genocide, right? An attack, an attack on the culture and memory and such. And in recent years, especially, I find myself um, giving talks on something else connected, let's say, to the war, but on the road back to the airport and the colleague is driving me back and we suddenly are having a conversation about the Holodomor. And I have to explain that that's not, you know, a nationalist invention um, in diaspora, but that's actually what Stalinist officials were thinking and trying to establish these connections, actually kill people based on the connections to the peasant question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergei. Um, we have come to the conclusion of our conference, which has been a very fast 